Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk. I'm Colette Mello, and today we're here with artist Monica Bravo. I'd like to thank the City of Miami Beach, Department of Tourism, and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these art talks and other programming that we are able to offer to the community. Monica Bravo is a multidisciplinary artist who currently resides in Miami Beach. Her work integrates a wide array of disciplines from psychotechnologies to immersive sculptural environments. She was recently awarded a visual arts fellowship in Italy. Recent and upcoming public art commissions include OGX BRT in Ogden, Utah, Liminal, a poetic glass intervention for the art for, for the Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport, Unas Mundos by the City of Boston Mayor's Office of Art and Culture and the Boston Art Commission for a large scale mosaic and glass mobiles in the East Boston Police Headquarters. headquarters. An Interval of Time 2020 by the Landmarks Public Art Program at the University of Texas for the Jackson School of Geoscience and duration for the MTA Arts and Design Project Prospect Avenue Subway in Brooklyn. Bravo has exhibited her work nationally and internationally. And just to name a few of the venues, they include the Rubin Museum of Art in New York, the 56th Venice Biennale representing the Vatican City State, the new museum in New York, and recently here in Miami as part of the Miami Beach No Vacancy Program. Thank you, Monica, for joining us today. I'm handing over the screen to you now. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited about sharing my work. So let me know if you can see something. We see your intro screen, yes. Great, so I'm, we're gonna go slow and I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna show a part of the process and the reasons why I do what I do with so much passion. So, uh, how do you do this? Okay, so now you can see it. So here it says, how do I serve? For me, for me, being of service is the most important thing, both as an artist and as a human being, because I'm here to connect. That means that I, you know, I connect emotionally. I want to communicate and I want to inspire other beings to be themselves. But I also feel that when I connect to people, I get inspired. I love that word inspiration because it really comes from the ability to be connected back to spirit because spirit spirit is everything we're just here living a human experience but the spirit is within us so my main thing is authenticity sovereignty how to be oneself so this is what i aim in every single piece of work that i do that's what i i want to inspire other people to do I don't know how, okay here so who am i i am a person since i was very little that i was so curious that i was driving every teacher crazy and I still do because I still study and I'm that girl that is always with her raised hand going like me 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 look at me look at me I have the question and I have the answer I'm super super curious and that ability of curiosity has led me to go into many different realms so I'm always asking about what's the meaning of things what is the truth what is reality what is science neuroscience um psychology I even became an astrologer four years ago because I want to understand how we are connected uh, with our mythology. So all this is um, very much a part of the process where I get all my artwork. Okay, so I did not go to art school. That's the big one. Um, um, <laughs> I decided to study something else when I was growing up. I was very curious. So I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. So I started doing fashion. I went to Italy. After four years of fashion, I decided, no, this is not what I want to do. So I started doing photography. I became a black and white photographer for a while. And, and I you know, became very good with the craft. And I loved the dark room. I loved it. And I was teaching. Uh, but it was like all the work that I was doing was more commercial. So there was a part of me that it was kind of dying inside. I wanted to be able to be like an artist, but I didn't even know that you could be an artist doing photography because this was way before photography was part of the mainstream in, in art. This was beginning of the 80s. And um, so after, after going here and there, because I lived everywhere, I lived in Europe and in like six different countries. I learned all these languages. I decided to go back to Colombia for a bit. And then there is when I started thinking, I was in my thirties that maybe I need to go to a new place and find my way of becoming an artist. And that's when I moved to New York. 
So in New York, I did not study art, but I had all the museums, all the galleries, and I had like the discipline that, that is really good part of myself, where I, when I want something, I'm very committed. So over there, I created a system where I would um, create art without having any, I don't know, limitations. I will, I will be in my studio and people say, what are you doing? I'm making art. I didn't know how what was to make art, but I will try to film things. I'll try to draw, I'll try, I tried many things. And then I ended up slowly, slowly getting my own um, language and my own methodology. Uh, now that I, all this time has passed by, I'm quite impressed at the way, how I arrived here because I really didn't have uh, anybody telling me how to do it. But maybe that's my biggest asset is that I've been able to figure a lot of things by myself. That doesn't mean that I don't read. That doesn't mean that I'm not interested in other artists. It means that the way I got the knowledge is through experience. I'm all about it, being empirical. And being empirical is almost like a scientist. You got to try here, you got to try there. And then when you find something that works, you keep on doing that. Um, one of the most important things in my work is that I want to provide a platform so the viewer can relate to a sense of presence. Um, I'm always questioning what is reality? When does a space become a place? I'm very interested in memory. I'm interested in how the whole world is functioning. And I also noticed since I was little that I was a very emotional person. So I had to study with teachers, most like there were Chinese um, martial arts because I wanted to understand why I was so emotional if there was any way that I could uh, suppress my emotions but I got really lucky with a very good teacher that told me that actually the most important thing that we have is our emotional body so thank god I didn't repress them <laughs> so uh, that's why for me in my art the most important question when I create something is when I put it out there I want the viewer to to ask this question how does art make you feel? Not what you think about it, but how is it making you feel? Or do you feel connected to it? Do you feel connected because of the shapes, the color? Does it remind you of something? How do you relate to it? Because I think that it is very important uh, to understand that relationships is, are the core of everything. We understand who we are through our relationships, not just romantically, but relationship to, to how we sleep, what we eat, how we relate to money, how we relate to um, politics you know everything that you do in this life is all relational so for me being able to provide a platform for the viewer to connect where they're at at this moment that was something that i uh, understood very early on another thing that i'm very interested in is time i do believe that time is circular it's cyclical i have a problem believing in the um, narrative that you know you start here and you finish there because i think that, that that has caused a lot of problem in history thinking making people think and believe that time is uh, linear this connects us a lot from nature if you look at the trees or you look at the mountains or you look at the rivers i mean they're not counting with a clock they they know exactly how everything evolves because they have their own consciousness about time so i'm interested in, in representation in the representation of time and materiality and using very different technologies. So one of the uh, projects that I started questioning this really deeply was 10 years ago. I actually started doing this piece in 2009, but I finished it in 2012. It took me three years to make. And I was questioning whether destiny was something that I create, I mean, that I'm giving a destiny, or is it something that I can transform, or is it a combination of two? is life that fixed. So I had this idea of creating a piece that uh, was coming out of nowhere, like I was not taking pictures or anything, but I would go to Google Maps and look for skylines of cities and then create with text the skylines of the cities and animate them. So I created this piece, it's called Landscape of Belief. And it's a, it's a sculpture installation that calls into question how we construct our lives according to our belief systems. Because I think that you know the more we believe in something more rigidly, the less free we are because we are just so restricted by that belief system. I'm not saying the religion is a bad thing or philosophy is a bad thing, but what I'm saying is that when we get so conditioned by ideas, we get limited by them. So I wanted to use the reference of literature and architecture because there are two things that are like tangible somehow, um, one more than the other, you know, like architecture, uh, 
buildings you know have shapes and they have they define form so you can get restricted by architecture or it's, you can get limited you know you you have a door you have a wall you have you know you have different things that uh, shape the space and literature helps you um, shape your way of thinking so I wanted to use these two as tools to express what is it that we you know what is it about belief systems so I I I first envisioned this um, space that it will be transparent, they will have a, a glass with projections. And I was going to find a text that, that spoke in a way that it was poetic, but it spoke about um, something had to do with architecture. So I found the book of Italo Calvino, Invisible Cities. It's a beautiful book. If you have not read it yet, it's, it's, it's a must read. It's, it's, um, it's written by this Italian um, writers called Italo Calvino. And it's just a story that is told by, our, it's fiction, but it's told by, by Marco Polo. He's talking to the great uh, Kublai Khan in China. And he says, you know, tell me how are my cities? So he starts telling all these stories about what cities are made of, but it's some, there's so much poetry in it that I decided to take the whole text of the book. And with the book and the text, I ended up making the cities. So you see these letters there, they're all part of that book. And this has two forms, it's the projection. I mean, here you see the animation, they're actually projected onto the glass and they're quite, um, uh, I don't know how to say the word, like they are very mesmerizing, that's, that's the word I wanna say, uh, because people don't know what they're looking at. They don't know where the magic is coming and it's just pure optical. I'm just putting light with an animation into glass but I have the, the glass has a surface that can retain a little bit of the light. And then uh, it's just how you present things. So I'm very interested in projections. I'm also interested in projections psychologically because I've been studying a lot Carl Jung, you know, he's a psychologist that, that he talks very much about our unconscious. And he, he coined the term shadow work. And it is through shadow work that I have found out that I have been able to really go through my trauma and reshape the way I, I feel about it now instead of like, I don't know, like reliving it every day. Um, here's um, the image, the still image of, of the sculpture. And then you can see some other images that are printed on the wall like this. These ones are beautiful because they're really big. And when you get close to them, you can actually read the text. And uh, when we were doing this, I really make sure that the text was written in a way that if somebody really wants to go and read the text, they can read the text from left to right. So then the question was, after I did that project, like, okay, so if I was born in Colombia, why don't I live there? Because I left Colombia very early on. And so I decided to go back and start making a project that had to do with the landscape that I miss a lot. There's a lot of mountains and, and the skies are very much like here in Miami, like very vivid because the tropics always have like this beautiful uh, clouds hovering around. So I really needed to be connected to the mountains, but I decided to go and up to the Sierra, La Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is the highest mountain in the world that is closest to the sea level. And we have snow. I mean, right now there's not so much snow, but there are um, four different tribes of indigenous people that live there and they take care of the, of the, um, of the mountain and they weave these bags that they call mochilas and within this uh, woven bags, there's some language. So I started getting interested in the idea of weaving as a way of communication that we have that is so ancestral. And the first form of communication was uh, the weaving. And actually the word textile and text comes from the same root. So if you go through, through all the history of, of humankind, the first way, like, uh, you know, the grandmothers were always weaving. And the interesting thing is um, all the things that people were weaving were trying to uh, represent nature or belief systems. So, but because the, um, the, the technology is going is binary and is going, you know, one direction, horizontal and one vertical, this creates the shapes that are a little bit more square. That's why you see here in the, in the screen, um, you see shapes that are more abstract. So for me, it was very interesting to see how abstraction starts happening from textile. Before the abstract painters, you know, 100 years ago, we had weavings. So I was very interested in that part of the representation that it was the abstraction that you can get through weaving. And here again, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about time and I'll show you a little bit 
how this video is done. So this is like a black wall and there are four projections. And I wanted to create a piece where you actually are revealing, like if it was a simulation of some, something being woven. Here, this, um, these lines are called the thought of the, of, of the women. So then what happened was like, as you were weaving and you were in the center of the piece, then you can start revealing the landscape of this place. So a lot of the images, these are all done in Colombia. So the, the flowers and the plants are all very typical from, from my country. So there's an aspect about my work when I do animation, all kinds of work, um, is that I want people to be connected to it. So I tend to do things that are very hypnotic. So I work with time in ways that um, is very intentional, the way I use time, because I want people to be, or even materials to be completely taken into another place. Because when you are taken to another place, maybe you can start reconnecting to a part of yourself that is normally not connected because you're busy doing something else. So it's almost, that's why I say I create a platform for that kind of um, thing to happen. But that happens only if the person wants it to happen. I'm not inducing or influencing any, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really, it's, it's something that is very um, subtle. Can you talk, can you, um, on the weavings, where was that displayed and how big is the size when you're projecting that? It's well, quite lovely. One, thank you. This has been uh, shown in many different places. The one before was shown at the Bard um, uh, Institute in New York, and there were four walls, um, and the walls, it was like a room, a small, not a small one, it was a medium-sized room, and then we had the projectors, but, but I asked them to paint the whole thing in black. Then this exhibition went, because it was part of a group show created by Jose Roca, where it was uh, a lot of the artists were Colombians and he was uh, talking about the rivers in Colombia and the weaving and a, a lot of stuff that had to do with material culture, uh, by the way. So um, it has been shown in Spain, in Washington, like I have a list, so it, it depends, but I have different ways of showing it because sometimes I don't have it as a projection, but I have it in, in, um, in monitors. I, I have the tendency to adapt to the place. And these are um, pieces, like these colorful things are taken from the videos, but then they're reduced to the color. And here, that's when I started being very, um, I don't know, so I'm being very occupied with color. And there was a woman that I really got very um, inspired by. Her name was Sonia Delone. She was an artist in the 20s. She was Russian or Ukrainian, by the way. And then she lived in Paris. She was married to this very famous artist called Robert Delaunay. But she was the one who was amazing. She was doing textiles. She was being a mother. She was painting. She was, so for me, she's like the ultimate artist because she never saw a difference between applied and fine art. And that's the way I relate to art. So there's no, there's no difference between this and that. So here you see ways of how I present when it's projected. And, and these pieces um, that are, they're not necessarily coming from the videos, but they're as part of the process. This is a completely different, this is a, a completely different piece. It's called Built Object. In 2015, I left a marriage of 20 years and I just walked out and I just didn't want to be married anymore. And, but one of the things that happened is like one day I got to my studio and I found a lot of things on the floor, like things that I've been working on. And instead of throwing them away, I decided to start doing doing all these arrangements. And so these are pieces that are leftovers from other pieces. And, but this piece I love very much because, and they're unique. I don't really do unique stuff. Um, and I, I started painting myself. I used to uh, allow only like uh, my assistants to paint. I didn't go to art school, so I didn't know how to paint. And so I, I always hire people to do all the drawings and, and, and stuff like that. But this one, I was just tempting to be doing something completely different. So I love this piece because it's the moment where I realized that I had to, you know, like take all the pieces that they were broken and shattered and, and put them together. And so I, I, I really love this piece very much because it's something, it's part of my life, very meaningful moment in my life. This is a piece that I did after that was the base for a commission that I did for the MTA, for the subway station in New York. This is video. And um, I wanted to create, I mean, there were five murals, I'll show them a little bit. Um, 
but I wanted to create the murals from the MTA based on, on these animations. So here's, I, I'm already starting to explore a lot the space and I'm not shy about exploring the walls, using paint, using all kinds of elements like wood or plexiglass or you name it, like whatever I find, I just put it in and I make it part of, a, of the piece. In a, in a way that is fun. This was done a little bit later because I, I, here, for instance, the, in 2018, I decided to just completely go co all the way and integrate everything. I said, I don't wanna just be doing things that are limited. I wanna be able to do everything because that's the way I, I am. I'm, I don't have limitations and I suffer a lot when I had to be defined. So I, yeah, I do animations and I started doing from the, from the images that you saw the, the subway station happen. And then from those images, I ended up making these uh, textiles. And from the textiles, I made kimonos. So for me, it's just, there's no difference. And that's why I was uh, recalling Sonia Delaunay because she, she was a big inspiration for me. And this is uh, part of the process of the, of the subway. I mean, here, this is just like in one page, everything like up there you see like part of my work and then you see the presentation that I, I sent so I when I want it and then a little bit of the process and then how it's finished which is like this so I don't know if you see the relationship between the kimono this and and the even the the pieces that I found out in the studio after I after I got divorced they're all like starting to have um, a way um, that is a little bit different than the one about the weaving or about the one the one about the cities that is transparent there's there's a language here that starts developing and so when I did this piece I'd never done a mosaic but I love uh, communicating with the um, fabricators so it was very important for me to convey exactly what I wanted and what I always do have certain things that are very important. So in this case, there was the transparency was very important. And the other thing, like a sense of transparency, like if things were like floating all over, that's one of the things that I wanted. And I also wanted the color to be very specific. So I, I we went back and forth. I went to Germany, I worked with them and I was very meticulous about certain things that I wanted, uh, to have in the mosaic. And I like the way these people work because the, the kind of mosaic that they do is very free. It's not like if you, there are different techniques in mosaic, but this one, they're just, they don't have a one technique. They're just like really doing everything. All, everything is possible here. So this is another piece is called uh, Timeless. And this is an ephemeral commission by, I was commissioned by MasterCard. They wanted to launch in 2019, uh, uh, some macaroons. And MasterCard has been, uh, putting a lot, or was at one point, putting a lot of money into the arts, into music, art, and food. And so they hired somebody else and me to do this um, temporary um, ephemeral commission that only stood for five days. And this, all the project, there are 30 projections which are projected on a, on a paper wall. So I had worked with these people from Vancouver before. And so this, this, these things are like 10 feet high and you just move them around the space. And what holds them is the air that goes inside of the paper. But the projections, I had to work with a mapping person. So this was a fun project, but it was crazy because I didn't have time to really test it. It had all to be done in my mind. And then we only had like uh, two days to install. And then it, it was a miracle when, when, it, when it happened. It's, it's quite a beautiful project. I love this project very much. It looks amazing for something that you said you couldn't really test out until the very, until it was installed, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but the thing is, this is like, with time you start getting a lot of experience. So there's like, I haven't, remember I said, I didn't go to art school, but I did create a methodology. So I'm very intuitive and I have always followed my intuition and in order for me to, not to copy something, but to replicate something, I, I take a lot of notes. So when I want to do something similar, I will go back to my notes and go like, oh, this is the way I did this. So maybe I can test this other thing. So I'm always willing to go to a place I have not been because that's where I learned something new. 
So in this place, I had not done something. I always wanted to work with this projection, with these walls, because I have this, actually, I have one here in my house. They're white, and I fell in love with them. These are designers in Vancouver, and they, they have built these things for dividing spaces. And, and I always said to them, like, oh, I want to do something that has to do with a lot of color. And then when, when we did this, uh, we ended up buying, well, I didn't buy them, Master got like 15 of them. And that's where we used 30, um, 30 projections all over. It was very successful, this piece. I want, I, I mean, we were going to do more, but then pandemic happened. So I'm in talks with them to see if we can have this, because the idea was to have this replicated in many different places in the world. On your subway, I just wanted to back up for on the subway proposal from start to finish, from when you submitted a proposal to you finished it, it sounded like quite a project. How long did that take? Well, for that one, let me remember, um, I was I was nominated to present some plan. I remember it was, I think it was the summer of 2016. So I had to, usually you have six weeks to propose. They, the norm is six weeks. Sometimes they will give you an extra week, but all proposals that are paid, that they pay you for like, a, as a, like they nominate you or they select you, they're usually four to six weeks. So you have that time to create a project. You, and this one specifically, I had to present it like it was weird because nowadays you do everything digital. No, here I had to print some boards like billboards and deliver them by hand and it was odd because what the way they do it they just present it by hand and, and the jury is there in front and they pick whatever they like the best so i was then notified so i think let's say that my deadline was in june and then in september i remember i was in london and i got a call and they told me that i had won that station and i was over the moon i was so happy because i really wanted to have my own station and now that i don't live in new york it's like i don't care i have my own station <laughs> So, so here I wanted to show you a little bit the process like you see these guys here like in order to do this um, I do a lot of uh, collage and I go back and forth from like the digital to the printed and to the collage I, I like to have a little bit of that um, more and more before I didn't really care so much about the material but it's been I don't know 10 years that I really want to touch things and cut and paste and and then re photograph and intervene. And so I don't now I have a problem because I don't know exactly what started first, whether the egg or the or the hand, like I don't know, the chicken or the hand. I, I don't know. It's just it's, it's a process that is very um organic. So in this in this one I did that. This is for, from another piece. So I do a lot of these collages and then I, I stay with this. This is for another animation. I, and I stay and I, I just keep those. This, they become part of my collection. I don't really sell the collage. I love them. This is something that is much older, but it's, it's interesting because, for instance, there are times with the, with the commissioner, they want to have something printed on vinyl and you go like, oh, vinyl. But this is for a hospital. So they want to be able to, to have this thing, like if they need to reprint them again or something happens and they have to wash them or something. Uh, so vinyl will be the best thing for a hospital. So this is in the emergency room in the Westminster and Chelsea Hospital in London. This is a beautiful piece, but this one has the story. I had put some text of the Italo Calvino part of the building. Um, and by when they printed it out, you can't have that text there, but it was very subtle. And I say, why not? Because, because there's certain words that you cannot have here because uh, you know it's not allowed. So it was interesting because sometimes there's certain restrictions. Like here, the commission said, don't do many fussy stuff. We don't want people to think that you know that they're seeing double or they're not okay because this is an emergency room. So there's certain things that are limitations. So here we're jumping to another piece that I did for the University of Texas. So this is an interesting piece because when I was hired to do this piece was in 2011 and they wanted me to create a piece for like a sphere that it was going to be at the Jackson School of Geology. But once I finished the piece that is not like this one, I wanted to test the globe, it was a globe. And I started talking to the people, the technicians in Silicon Valley and they had no idea what they were doing. And I knew, I remember I called the, the president of Landmarks and I said, the, the commissioner, and I said, oh, I can't do this. You know, uh, it's not going to look good. I held the commission and I said, we have to figure out the, the technical part because that's another thing that is important. Like you're the owner of the work. And if the work is not going to be represented the way that you envision, you should not present it. 
especially if you're working with some other people from outside or, that are going to do be part of the, the technical thing. So I ended up like 10 years later, like we finished this in 2020 and nine years later, almost 10, I, I, I had put the, the project on hold. So what happened was like I said, beginning of the pandemic, I said, I think we should really go back to the project and try to do it without the sphere, the, the globe. Um, and so I proposed three uh, screens and, and this is what ended up having uh, happening. So here you see a little bit. So, and this one's is interesting because I had done this and designed this when I was doing the Italo Calvino uh, project with the cities and the text. So it still has some text in it. And what I found out is like a lot of geologies, um, they write poetry. They write poetry and they do poetry in reference of earth and minerals. So I use a lot of the poetry and in the text in one of the shapes that they look like, I don't know, like data. So it's interesting. And, and this one I was exploring also like different colors that I have never really dared. So. I'm, I'm the one that is very surprised with color when things happen. I'm like, whoa, what happened there? <laughs> so this is a lot of pink in here. And I've never been like a pink or blue person, but I, I love it now because I just allow my imagination to go. So, yeah. This piece I love very much. I haven't seen this piece installed. I should go to Austin because I, it was installed during the pandemic. Um, so I haven't seen it. But I'm so it's in going. Austin at the museum. Where is it in Austin? It's a, okay. So the University of Texas has a oh, very mm -hmm. important. Um, they have a very important program that is all is just commissions for artists. So they have like pieces James Turrell and Hamilton just finished one. Like everybody had not everybody, but big names have uh, a pavilion in one of those each of the schools. The woman that runs this pro this 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 program is amazing, Andre. A Bulger, like she is really invested in having very good commission work in each of the departments. Yes, this is fantastic. Yeah, so here you can see the text. These things that are moving are all text that are, is poetry. So one thing that happens is like, because for me, everything is materiality. So sometimes I will use ideas, images, or something similar from one project to the next. So there's a continuation. There's a continuation. So you said that here you see, you, you can see the text there and you can see the minerals and the colors that are like that. And then I like a lot to work with texture. I think that in digital world, we don't have texture, but what I do is I photograph the screen, I photograph the textiles, I come back and I always want to talk about the texture. There's so much texture in life. And when we're online, we don't have that texture. So I'm, I'm interested in, in that like aspect of, of being human, that is the body. Here we have other stuff. So this is something that happened during the pandemic in Bogota. They called me the museum and they said that they wanna commission me to do something for the newspaper. So this was interesting because you know nobody at the beginning of the pandemic, nobody was doing anything. But this curator that now, this curator is Italian and he just curated the Italian pavilion in the Venice Biennale. He's the director of the museum in Bogota. So he created this uh, show with 50 artists from Colombia and they gave us like a, a, every week we will have the whole page of the newspaper. So I created this piece uh, during the pandemic and I was talking about that the only revolution is to be oneself, that we have to be uh, very connected to our bodies because that's when I started seeing, okay, the world's gonna change and we're not taking care of ourselves. We're still abiding by some law of somebody an authority outside and so I really I took it very seriously to start studying a lot of I went back to school and I started I did all kinds of uh, stuff related to trauma to psychology junior psychology I went deeper into my studies of astrology and so I was very interested in seeing like how can I um, um, integrate all that with my work so this piece is very important because of that it's just a little image, but it just gave me so what I like about these images is that they ended up uh, putting them all over uh, Bogota. So they sent me this picture from, and I love this picture. So I'm gonna, this one is, um, so what was it, 2014, I was, I had a phone call from the Vatican saying that they wanted to come to my studio and meet me. And I was like, I thought it was a joke. I was like, Vatican, you know, I, I was born Catholic, but I'm not a practitioner. So I was a little bit like, what's going on? I didn't even know they had a, a pavilion. So I was uh, invited to 
commission a piece for the Vatican for, for the Venice Biennale. So I, they wanted me to do the, either the piece of the text or the textile. But I told the curator, what if I propose something new? So the theme was the, um, the Gospel of John, the one that says in the beginning there was the word and the word was God and God was within. So I was very interested in, in that the text was in Greek. I, I speak Greek because I lived in Greece. And I always been questioning the, the word of God. Like I have a, my own relation to spirituality, but I, I, have, I think I have a problem with the fixed word because that's what makes people interpret things and the meaning can really change from person to person. So I was like, oh, this is great. It's going to talk a little bit about how skeptical I was actually made them a proposal saying that I was going to debate the idea that the word of God, as they call it, is the ultimate. What if, what if every person can relate to the idea of the sublime through landscape or through art? That was my, my, my proposal. So I went into Malevich because the beginning of, of abstraction, he just was very, very bold and he decided to take away every figure, human figure, and just put a black square. And he spoke a beautiful, he wrote a beautiful manifesto that it was called the Suprematist Manifesto, where he says that the most important thing is the emotions. So I really relate to his work. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a big reference to him. And also to Joseph Albers. You'll see why I, uh, I have Joseph Albers because so he created a font case in 2000, in, sorry, in 1926, 23, for the Bauhaus with shapes, geometrical shapes that it was supposed to be used for, for poster. I used references to art to make the piece for the Vatican. So here you have, so this is the, this is what I sent them as a proposal, like that I wanted something to be moving. Um, I wanted text and I wanted nature. This is, this is uh, the proposal. This is also part of the proposal. And then in, in, inside the, the Arsenale, like this, this building where you, where you show in Venice, there are all these columns that are useless, but they're visually there. So I was like, oh, how am I gonna show this? I don't wanna use the walls. It's, it's like, they're all these columns. So I decided to break the, the, the symmetry of the space and create, um, use these walls to create these panels of color that they will be uh, holding both glass floating and TV screens. So this is part of the proposal too. So here you see a little bit like I'm already thinking about putting text. Uh, I wanted to use the original text in Greek. Where the Gospel of John was, uh, was in Greek. I speak Greek because I lived in Greece. Uh, so it was fun for me to go back to the idea of Greek um, and do it in, in this piece. So this was part of the proposal. These are first experiments of, but then the text, I didn't want people to be able to read the text because that's the whole point. It's like the word, the meaning of the word is not important. What is important is like the relationship to how you think that God is. Because when you, when you get stuck with the word, then, you know, people still fighting over definitions. So this is, and I, I think at the time, no, I'm sure there was the big Matisse uh, um, exhibition at the MoMA. I remember, I think it's the first time I, in 20 years or something, 27, that I lived in New York where the MoMA was open 24 hours so people could see the exhibition because people were lining up for hours. It was the most beautiful exhibition. I cried so much. I love Matisse. It's one of my like artists that I was so inspired by. So I, I took the, pap the papers here in the middle and I took those colors and this is, these are the base of the colors that I wanted to put the palette. So this is, this is what I, I proposed to, you see this, this piece here, this is what I proposed for the pavilion. So this is a little bit how it looks. And so I want you to look also, okay, so this is the pavilion, whatever, but at, to the right, I want you to look at the images because this, this is important it's going to lead to the Boston piece. So this, these images that are stills are like books, like the Bible books and they're open and there's a transparent piece on top and they have the forms of Joseph Alvarez of the, of the typeface, but I chose words in Latin that you can understand because the funny thing was that there were all these people who were sent to South America to convert and to all the colonies to convert the natives to the Catholic religion 
and they were giving the text in Latin. So um, for me, it's a big joke that you were supposed to read and understand. It's like, what's going on? So this was like my whole proposal. The, the curator was a little bit like, oh, you cannot do this. And I'm like, and I won't do it. Like, I, if you're going to give me the opportunity to, to, to talk about the gospel, I want to talk it from the perspective of, of, of what I see. So this is, and this is when color started really appearing in my, in my, in my work and I started being everything but shy. Okay, so here, um, this is like two minutes. So there's going to be a voice of me talking about the project. So this is the one that I just finished in Boston. Unus Mundus, the spirit of the piece is the potential for dialogue. With courage, find a vocation embodying your perspective to serve in community. The shapes of the suspended flow glass are abstractions of these words. Using a modular typeface from Joseph Albers that was created in 1923 for the Bauhaus movement, consisting of three shapes, a square, a circle, and a quarter circle of the same radius organized on a grid. The glass printed ceramic mosaics on the wall behind the mobiles represent the original five islands of East Boston that became one with the landfill that was used to make the airport. This fragmentation, separation of the internal self is reflected in society these days. My intention for the piece is to invite viewers to move around the space, embodying the various perspectives, seeing it as new, and in that be in the potential for dialogue. Glimpses of vintage maps and photos, topography and architecture printed on the ceramic are embedded throughout the mosaics and share layers of meaning. My main focus is authenticity with the piece serving as an invitation to experience the material from its different vintage points incorporating beauty as a lofty expression of materiality and the freedom felt by not trading authenticity for safety. Part of the process of conceptualizing the piece was a community engagement workshop in which I created a whimsical space to explore and identify the differences in emotions, perspectives, and sensations in the body. I am any truth. My vision is a synthesis of all disciplines, guiding me to manifest a reality that matches my desire to evolve. With deep commitment, I create mesmerizing environments for public spaces. I enjoy directing and producing diverse projects from complex multimedia installations and public art commissions to artist books, textile design, and community workshops. Thus, I see no boundaries between the applied and fine arts. I would like to thank everybody that was involved in the fabrication, installation, and production of the piece in Boston and elsewhere. Thank you. Monica Bravo, 2022. So this was the last day in the, of the installation in Boston. Oh, and I'm still like, in awe with this piece and I'll show you all the process because it, it was really quite fantastic. One of the first things is I never done a mobile. I never done a hanging sculpture. And so when I was hired, I was asked, uh, you wrote in the application, you wanna do this. Do you know how to do it? And I said, no, how are you gonna do it? And I said, well, give me the money and I'll, and I'll hire the best people. <laughs> so that's what I did. So I'm very excited because um, many of these projects you create in your mind, you actually make probably mock-ups, but you don't know what's gonna happen until you don't see it. So here I'm gonna show the slides a little bit faster of the process. And then if you have questions, let me know. So this part of the community engagement was important because one of the rooms is gonna be used by a community. We all know what's going on with the police and how um, divided the whole country and the world is regarding you know, the service of being police. So I wanted to create a piece where we understand what dialogue means. And in the original piece that I did for, for the Vatican, I was, I was talking about the word logos, which means reason, and dialogos means I reason with you. So to be able to have a dialogue, dialogue means that I'm going to give myself time and space to listen to you. 
I don't have to convince you that my ideas are better, but I have just the opportunity to listen to you as I would like you to listen to me. And that's what happens when two people are able to listen to one another. Maybe a third thing happens and that's what's a dialogue. So I wanted to, to create this in a very whimsical way and using uh, the idea of, of like a child uh, vision. I use all these exercises that I've been training to do, um, you know, through breath. I wanted, uh, I created this workshop that is the difference between what we perceive, you know, we think that we're this, we think that we're that, but they're all perceptions that are based on emotions that we have felt. And there's another thing called somatic experience. I don't know if you've ever heard about it. It's very in vogue right now, but it is how do you reconnect, how you reconnect with your emotions via the acknowledging what you're feeling in the body. That's called felt sense. And I'm very, um, I'm very much into that right now. I've been I've been taking all the workshops and, and running workshops. And so this piece was all done first, the workshop, and then I did the the piece. So yeah. I'm... So here a little bit of the process. Again, the image. So once I started doing this, I was like, oh, what am I gonna do with the mobiles? And then I remembered this piece and I go, ta-da, let's take it and see what happens. Obviously, I had never done one. So I had to learn a lot about weight, about the engineer, about <laughs> everything. This is the, the font case of Joseph Alvarez. If you see it on the left, these are the shapes of the alphabet. And then I started playing with them all over with uh, creating stuff. So you see it all, all around. I also wanted to get some texture. So texture was important, but then, you know, when you have many ideas, you have to start after editing, otherwise it's too complex. So I wanted to have both mosaic and um, and hanging sculptures. And that was gonna be a risk because maybe what if the two of them, they don't get together, they don't get along. So I had to give up a little bit the, the, the texture on the glass the way I wanted, but they were able to convey my feeling in a very incredible way. So here's my drawings of how I, I send the stuff here in Miami, my, my window. I was making a lot of experiments. I also had the, the I don't know if you can read, but the, the, this word on the left says courage. There are several words. It, each, each mobile says a word. One is courage, the other one is serve or service. The other one is community. The other one is embodied perspective and vocation. These are all the words. So this is all the process from beginning to end. It's a, it's a whole year and a half of working with the pieces. So the piece in itself, you know, what you, you're always giving a budget. So obviously you always want to make the biggest, the most beautiful and everything, but then the fabricator comes and goes, you know what, you only have this amount. So I was thinking, how can I make use of the space? And then I started thinking, oh, wait, the original is Boston was five islands. What if I break the mosaics into shapes? And these are like how I was trying to figure out the square footage because it's a whole like uh, thing. So I was trying to go first with squares and then with the shapes and that's how I figure out the, the pieces. Here's how um, they're making already the pieces and working with the color back and forth, talking a lot about emotions, talking about like, I want to see the images, talking about with the painter a lot. I, I spoke a lot about co certain colors that I don't want, certain colors that I want is certain um, textures that I would like and certain, so I'm very, I'm very meticulous about what I want and I am not afraid of asking for it. I don't wanna have something hanging and then I feel like, oh, I should have told them this and that. No, I am not shy. I, I'm actually a pain in the neck. Uh, when they see my emails, sometimes they go, oh, but I learned how to do that in a way. So for instance, here for the print, because these things are printed, I, I will send everything very clear. I want this, I want that, and I will have meetings because it's very important that you communicate what you, what you want. These people are very professional, but they're actually, uh, if you don't give them a direction, they will interpret your design. I know some artists, they don't care about having interpreted. I, I don't want people to interpret, I want people to convey my, my intention, which is different. Here, more stuff, here, more stuff. So here's where it's printed, which is beautiful, some places. So then the designer of the mobiles was like, oh God, like the engineer, like I wanted certain things and they were not. So I learned a lot. Now I can teach anything about hanging sculptures. <laughs> and one thing that it was very important was the hanging plate. 
I wanted to be part of a piece. And so the surprise when I mounted uh, the people who had been, you know, the engineers and everything that be part of the piece that when they saw it with color, they were like, oh, we didn't know it was going to be color. Yes. So it's really beautiful that when you are down and you look up and you see the color, it's, it's fabulous because then everything is contrasting. I use color as a contra contrast for emotions. And depending on the, the time of the day, the piece becomes very different. Here are the details of the printing. I mean, very difficult to photograph this piece because there's not a single, and one of the things is that there's not a single place where you can see the whole piece all together. So you have to move. And that's the whole idea about dialogue. You have to change your perspective and try to understand the person that you're talking to from their point of view to see if you learn something. So this is, okay, so I jump into something else that I proposed for, I, I did not get this commission. I was a little bit upset. This is for the subway station in, in LA for the UCLA. And I found out when I was doing this proposal that the building of this UCLA is a replica of a, a church in Milan from the 1300s, actually the 1200s. This is called San Ambrogio. And I was laughing so much because that's like when California start being built, you know, they're, they're going and building replicas. So I thought it was, and, and I love Milan. I had just spent the whole summer in Italy. So I ended up making an homage to Italy. Um, the colors are very much coming from the Chirico, uh, Gio Ponti, like I made a big homage to Italy and to the Art Deco. So this is the proposal that I did for them. Uh, they just told me last week that I didn't get it. So I, that's another thing. It's like you learn to accept that somebody else got the thing. But the good thing, and I'm going to show you what I did with this. Um, I started working already with these images for something else, for the Odkin thing. Um, that um, I'll show you what I did with it. So this was, this was the Basilica parts here and there of my stay in Italy. This is a little bit of the process. These are not the images, but this is the process. This is like a little bit how I present the projects. Here you see the wall that was in Italy. I was doing a residency there, so that was fun. So this is what I ended up doing. This is for, for bus station. So I ended up using some of the images a little bit differently because I, this the whole thing here is based around a high school that is completely art deco and because the other piece he was also talking about art deco then i was like okay i'm just going to use pretty much so this is this is being printed right now so there's no bad i i, I mean sometimes you don't get something but it, then it becomes something else so i'm I'm not too attached to the things that I do. I just keep on recycling. So I was making, this is this is a city. So I was making reference to this building that is a fantastic piece of jewelry that they have in, in Utah. It's beautiful. Yeah, this, these are parts of, of Italy. Another thing that I do, and, and tell me if I'm okay with time. Uh, another thing that I do, hello? Yes, I think you're, you, what time is it? Yeah, you have a few more minutes. Yeah, yeah. so this is almost at the end. So this is, I, I've been doing textiles since I was little, like I studied fashion. And so I started just making them, like not being shy and making my dresses. So I make a lot of my clothes and they're, they have to be very simple. I can, I can make a piece of clothes like in five minutes. That's the whole thing. So I design all this stuff. I have them printed and I make my own clothes. And, and I have a lot of fun with it. So this was a part of my summer. Um, that I was making this, making this. So that's, um, I don't know if you have any more questions, but that, that was a presentation. It's really amazing. Your work is amazing. I do have a couple questions and I'm opening it up. I see Maria Lino's on. Um, so you use color a lot. I'm very interested in, if you would just talk about color, how important that is to you. You had mentioned earlier to me that you used to do photography in black and white, and then you just went into color. And you said and when you're working with fabricators, you're very particular about them getting the right color for you. Well, for me, color really represents a lot uh, the emotional body. And because when I was little, I would, I always been very emotional. So I, I, I noticed how people were very upset by my emotional body because I would be very like firm about things and so I was almost like taught not to like show my emotions so I was repressing them for a long time so I think that even becoming a black and white it was almost like I had to be muted 
And I thought that being emotional was a wrong thing, but then years passed by and I started studying martial arts with a very important teacher in my life in, in New York. And I asked him, he says, why are you here? And I said, I want you to teach me how to uh, get rid of my emotions. He was laughing, ha ha. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Um, on the contrary, I'm gonna teach you how to, how to make use of them because that's the most important thing that we have, our emotional body. And that's why all the workshops and everything, I always go back there. Now, the emotions are, uh, ways you, you can express your emotions through poetry you can or through through speaking or many different ways but when you do call color is another representation of, of emotion so I started really um digging a lot or allowing rather than digging like allowing anything possible to happen at my, like around the time that I did the piece for the Vatican I was like what if I do this because my 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 inspirations had been Matisse and Sonia Delaunay and Malevich. I was like, this, these people, they just work so beautiful. So I was like, what if I do it, but not copying, but just what would happen if I just go to the store and I buy the thing? So I let it be and it started coming out, coming out. And so the joke was when I started doing these pieces, uh, what happened to you? Now everything is color. And I said, yeah, I got divorced. Uh, all the color was suppressed. That's not true. I was suppressed before my divorce. <laughs> it was more when I was little. I was very afraid of showing my emotions. So it's very much related to, to the emotional body and how I find, I have found that the way, the amount of colors that I can see is way beyond like a lot of people. So when I, when I talk into a fabricator, I don't talk about the color. I talk about my emotion. I used to also direct people, my earlier works had a lot of sound. So I would commission people with music and I'm very, I know a lot of music. I don't know play anything, but I know same thing. I will always convey an emotion. This is what I would like people to feel. This is how, when people get into the room, this is the sensation. So I always talk about the sensations. I always talk about the emotions. So that's the way I connect to the fabricator or the person who's at the other side. Um, not through like, Pantone. I don't like. Right. No. I see. It's a it's a very visceral. It's it's a very from the body. It's like, mm -mm. and I know what is good and what is bad. I it's like, I think I'm more like a painter because I don't do storyboards or anything like that. I just like I know when a piece is finished. Just know, and I know when I cannot send it yet. You know, sometimes like not not long ago. I think it was with the audience. I, I had a deadline and I called and I said I don't like it. And they said. The deadline was today, and I said, I don't like it. I'll give you another day. And I'd learned also that that it's not the end of the world. I don't like it. Like, I don't want it to be up there. I don't like it. So, um, and I learned to trust that a lot. So until it's not perfect, not perfect, but exactly what I want. So Boston, when I saw it all together, I cried and I cried and I cried. And I called my brother and he said, but you're wrong when you were little was the same because I had a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. You're still doing what you were doing when you were little. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I, I see you said you do a lot of collage. I see that in your work, that collage background, which I absolutely love. I see that a lot. But I wanted to ask you, I, we don't have room time for very much. I'm going to ask you one more question. I'm very interested in you talked briefly about um, when you're working with public art and the community restrictions and how you have to deal with that. And you know, like you said, with working with the Vatican, they were very open and free, which I found wonderful. But then you were working with that other organization and the curator was like, no. And then you put it on the shelf for a little while. Can you talk about how you. I think I'm, that? Really good. What, I, I'm really good with limitations because I think that, you know, when you have something that is defined, you already know you cannot go over there unless you're trying to make a point. So for instance, limitations for me is like, is there a budget? Yes, how much is it? Uh, do you have a theme? No, okay, it's open. Oh, okay, let me see, what else can we do? And so I, I ask always a lot of questions to see what, what, how far can I go? And then sometimes the limitations that I'm giving are, are stuff that I go like, but why? So, I, so even when I have limitations, I go like, I'm gonna question this if it doesn't feel right. And so I always try to have a dialogue to see if there's any ways for me to express something in a way that is more important for me. Um, so for instance, in the, in the police department, I don't know, I, I really do not remember when I wrote, I wanna do a mobile. But I remember looking at it and I said, oh, this will be great. And I remember having an interview and they're saying, but you wrote it. And I was like, yeah, I think I did. And they said, but we want, 
you to do this piece, but can you do it? And I was like, hell yeah. Okay. And deep inside, I was like, oh God, you, and I, I could trust that. I could trust that I could do it because I can trust the process. So, but then I start, I have to call somebody who knows. And I said, tell me all the things that I cannot do. Oh, you cannot do this. You can, oh, oh, oh. and by every no, I, I say, what about this? What about this? So I'm, because I don't know, I'm, I'm ignorant. I actually ask the most outrageous questions. And sometimes somebody comes and goes, you know, I haven't thought about that. So let me try. So that's how I use limitations. Sometimes I just bump and I go, come on, let's try this. But I thought about this. And so something always arises. So even the people that did the, there were two people that I work with in Germany with the glass um, and the mosaic, but the people who did the structure are the same uh, people who created the structure for the Louvre, for the, for the pyramid. And they're used to working with us, but they're more like precise. And the person that I work with, he was like, I have to call you back. Your questions are too weird. <laughs> And so it, it was great because he was always trying to come up with something different, but we managed. And he was the one who was su super surprised, like, oh, this thing is not falling. And I was like, well, what? And I said, of course not gonna fall. But it was, it was that, we, we didn't know until it was up there. So it was fun. Well, thank you so much. It was so fabulous to meet you and to learn about your artwork. And I love that you have your own subway into New York. So you're still in New York. That's amazing. I want to go to your subway and that you were in the Venice Biennale and you're down here in Miami beach. So I, I love it. And I look forward to seeing you in person face to face sometime. So hopefully we'll run into each other when we're in the neighborhood. Oh, thank you so much, Juliet. This was amazing. Thank you. Keep me for anything. I love talking. I love meeting people. Any student that wants to reach out, I'm always on the Wonderful, because I have more questions. So <laughs> I don't want to keep you right now, but we'll connect at another time. So your work is amazing. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.